So TikTok might actually be banned. Emphasis in this case on might. Hello, my friends, Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about a rather interesting development that is happening in the United States, and that is that TikTok has a real possibility of being banned, or if not banned, it is under threat of being banned unless it actually sells its stake to the United States. In fact, the only reason that I'm talking about this now is because of the genuine geopolitical ramifications that could happen because of this. For those of you who are either seeing one of my videos here for the first time, or if you followed me for a long time but perhaps didn't know, I actually got my start on TikTok. That's where Stakui and everything here comes from. I mean, before I was making long-form video essays on historical topics as well as geopolitics, specifically, I was creating short historical content on TikTok. That was just my thing. It's only thanks to TikTok that I am here making this video in front of you now. And also, it is because of what is happening with TikTok that I am here making this video in front of you now. The House of Representatives in the United States Congress on Wednesday, March 12th, would pass a law that can potentially lead to a nationwide ban on the popular video app TikTok if its China-based owner doesn't sell its stake, as lawmakers have acted specifically on concerns that the company's current ownership structure is a national security threat. And when we talk about this, it's not like it's something that was potentially forced through Congress by a slight majority or anything like that. No, this received almost overwhelming bipartisan support, with a vote of 352 for and only 65 against. Now this is going to go to the Senate, where the prospects of exactly what is going to happen, well, we don't really know. It's all unclear. And as for why the US government would, for whatever reason, think that this app is a national security threat, that is because TikTok, which has more than 170 million American users, meaning about half of the entire country, this is something that is a wholly owned subsidiary of Chinese technology firm ByteDance. Lawmakers specifically contend that ByteDance is beholden to the Chinese government, which could theoretically demand access to the data of TikTok's consumers in the US anytime that it wants. The worry that we're talking about here is something that stems specifically from a series of Chinese national security laws that actually do compel organizations to assist with intelligence gathering. And I'm going to need to kind of explain that here, but we will get to that in a moment. Congress is genuinely serious about this, and a direct quote that I have from Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers, who is a Republican out of Washington, is, We have given TikTok a clear choice. Separate from your parent company, ByteDance, which is beholden to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, and remain operational in the United States, or side with the CCP and face the consequences. The choice is TikToks. If this bill does go and actually pass through the Senate, just like what it did through the House, then President Joe Biden has already said that if Congress passes this measure, he will sign it. The reality of the situation is that the House vote is just the latest example of increasing tensions that exist between China and the United States. By targeting TikTok, lawmakers are tackling what they see as a grave threat to America's national security. But in doing this, they are also singling out not all media platforms, but rather a singular popular platform, something with quite literally millions of people that use it, many of which skew younger, and this being just months before an election takes place. And I don't think people understand just the sheer ramifications of of what exactly that means. It is no secret that generally politicians don't really try to please everyone. That's the reality of it. Heck, many of them don't even try to please the majority of the people in their respective state. Instead, what politicians on both sides of the aisle have a tendency to do is try and appeal to their base, the individuals that they can rally up and try and get a rise out of to specifically go out and vote, which then has a tendency to skew things politically as you don't actually get the opinion of the majority of people. In this case, though, the United States may have kicked off a very young hornet nest. And TikTok itself is very well aware of this, as one of their spokespersons would say that the bill was something that was jammed through as part of a secretive process, and that, quote, we are hopeful that the Senate will consider the facts, listen to their constituents, and realize the impact on the economy, 7 million small businesses, and the 170 million Americans who use our service. China itself has also not stayed silent, where in anticipation of the vote, a Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson, Wang Wenbin, would accuse Washington of resorting to political tools when U.S. businesses fail to compete. He said that the effort would disrupt normal business operations and it would undermine investor confidence, that it would, quote, eventually backfire on the U.S. itself. But right now, the government is really only seeing the bipartisan support that this law has. Overall, 197 Republican lawmakers would vote for the measure, with 15 being against, and on the Democratic side, 155 would vote for the bill, and 50 being against. And so while the bill does have overwhelming political 
political support, as you can see here, simultaneously there are some people who are still against it. There are Republican opponents of the bill who say that the U.S. should warn consumers if there are data privacy and propaganda concerns, but that the final choice should be left with the consumers themselves, not the government. As one Republican representative, Tom McClintock, would say, the answer to authoritarianism is not more authoritarianism. The answer to CCP-style propaganda is not CCP-style oppression. Let us slow down now before we blunder down this very steep and slippery slope. And as another Democratic representative, Jim Himes, would say, quote, one of the key differences between us and those adversaries is the fact that they shut down newspapers, broadcast stations, and social media platforms. We do not. We trust our citizens to be worthy of their democracy. We do not trust our government to decide what information they may or may not see. But okay, when we are looking at this entire situation, obviously from everything that I have said, every single quote that I have given, this is a lot to process all at once. And for many people watching this, they're not going to understand the complete story as this is merely the latest chapter in a very troubled relationship that exists between the United States and TikTok, something that spans back about half a decade. So in order to really understand what is happening now, there are several things that first must be understood. Number one, the origin of TikTok, specifically Chinese ByteDance. Two, TikTok and Trump 2020, in which we saw the first warning signs of things being wrong. Three, the initial bans and legal action that would follow. Four, the infamous congressional hearing of March 2023. And then of course, the current ban itself. Also, on that note, if you all could do me a favor and like, comment, and subscribe, these videos take a long time to create, and I know that this is going to be a big one, so doing that lets me know that you actually like what it is that you are seeing and listening to. It really would help me out here and help push these videos in the algorithm, and gives me a job to actually make them. Your support means the world to me, and I thank you. And so, okay, at the center of this controversy of this entire ordeal is not necessarily TikTok itself, though obviously this entire thing is about TikTok, but rather the Chinese parent company that is headquartered in Beijing that is behind it, ByteDance, which I have to say here from the very beginning is not exactly a name that strikes fear into one's heart, I guess. And actually, the origin of ByteDance itself is something that pretty much bellies that exact same thing with its creator, Zhang Yiming. This right here is Zhang, the first founder of ByteDance, an individual who majored in software engineering at Nankai University in Tianjin, this being before he would earn his degree in 2005. Thereafter, he became an early employee of the travel website called Kushun, and from there he would progress from being just simply an engineer to the technical director in only about 12 months months. The guy moved very fast. After all this, he would go and join the microblogging company Funful, which if you want to compare that to anything, if you don't know what that is, which probably most people don't, it essentially was a Chinese Twitter clone. Like it was literally just a clone of Twitter for people in China. But this ended up closing for a time in 2009 because of censorship related to riots in the country. Go figure, China. And then once it reopened, well, sadly, it was unable to compete with the likes of Weibo and WeChat and other services that were already used in China. And so with that going nowhere, that same year, Expedia would go and announce that it was going to acquire Kushun. Zhang would then take charge of Kushun's real estate search business, and from there, he would start 99fang.com with his friend, Leung Rubo. I know that we're getting into a lot of background information here, but it's important to set the stage for what this guy was capable of creating, because 99fang.com was a real estate search engine platform for buying and selling and renting Chinese property. It is something that would also provide users with the latest real estate trends and the mortgage rates, among other things. This would actually be the first foray that Zhang would make into making his own product, so to speak. And so fast forward to 2012, three years later, and in a small apartment in Beijing, Zhang, Rubo, and several 99Fang employees would start working on an app that was going to be the predecessor to the ones that would come after. Called Nehan Duanzi, which literally means like profound gags, though no one probably understood like they actually speak Chinese what it is that I just said, because I, I don't really speak Chinese. This was an app that would allow users to circulate jokes, memes, and humorous videos. It was literally like just a funny gap. It, it was a thing for memes. It was a fun app. That was the whole point. Not something that you'd necessarily expect out of China, and lo and behold, the government didn't exactly think so either. It was the first major foray by the company, and ultimately, the Chinese government would end up shutting it down in 2018. Nehan Duanzi, by that point, had over 200 million users. Because again, go figure, China. But while that app would ultimately end up banned, and thus end horribly, ByteDance would simultaneously launch Totiao, which is the news app that would become the flagship for ByteDance for many, many years before TikTok was ever really a thing. And this app, my friends, this was exceptionally important to the development of ByteDance. So rapid was its growth that within two years, it had swollen to around 13 million daily users, and that is by 2014. This was going to be the first app that was going to have major and simultaneously long-lasting success for ByteDance. 
But the big thing is, is that Toutiao is specifically for China. If they wanted to go global, if they wanted to have a company that made products that could reach people all around the world, then to do that, they were going to need another app. And I know right now, at this point, you're probably thinking, aha, here's where we get to TikTok. Here's where it happens. No, first was Musical.ly. Now, I'm not sure how many of you people are actually familiar with Musical.ly, and I'm going to explain the concept because it's going to sound very familiar, even if you haven't have heard of the actual app. Officially launched back in August of 2014, Musical.ly was a video-based social media platform that would allow users to share and view short video clips ranging from 15 seconds to one minute long. Does that sound familiar? Users could select from different songs to add as soundtracks to their videos, and the app would help give rise to the popular lip sync video trend. Like other popular social media platforms that existed at the time and still do today, Musical.ly's millions of users could go and follow different accounts. They could like, they could comment it on, they could share other users' content, they could do pretty much any of this stuff. The other thing that needs to be noted about Musical.ly is that this also was a Chinese app. It was something that was headquartered in Shanghai, China, but it had gained a very large following internationally, especially in the United States. And from that, it was exceptionally popular with preteen and teenage girls. Again, does it sound kind of familiar? And if you're wondering why I'm bringing up any of this in the first place, when we're supposed to be talking about specifically things with TikTok, well, that is because on November 9th, 2017, TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, would end up buying Musical.ly for a whopping billion dollars. That is billion with a B, by the way. Now, originally, when all this went down, ByteDance had officially stated that Musical.ly was going to continue to operate as an independent app. It was something that was going to stick around. However, what ultimately ended up happening is that they shut Musical.ly down not long after they would acquire it in August of 2018, and this was going to be combined with a clone of the Chinese app Douyin, which was essentially Chinese TikTok. And that in turn would form the actual global TikTok that we know today. And this, my friends, is where the absolute meteoric rise of TikTok truly hits, because after merging with Musical.ly in August, downloads would increase drastically, and TikTok would become the most downloaded app in the entire United States. At least when we consider things on a month-to-month -month basis of new users. By February of 2019, TikTok, together with its Chinese variant of Douyin, would manage to hit 1 billion downloads globally. And this is excluding Android installs in China, mind you. In 2019, media outlets would cite TikTok as the seventh most downloaded mobile app of the decade, from 2010 all the way through 2019. And at that time, it was the most downloaded app on Apple's App Store from 2018 and 2019, surpassing Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. TikTok TikTok was effectively taking the world by storm, but the question was, how? Well, this is one of the things that would end up scaring US lawmakers, because TikTok's appeal relies specifically on what has been called an addictive video feed, the For You page. For You is filled with endless curated content that is selected specifically using TikTok's recommendation algorithm. It is similar to what you would already see on Instagram with the Explore page and other recommendation-based app designs, so that is true, but the difference is, is that while both apps will consider the videos that a user has interacted with in the past, the accounts, the hashtags, things that they have followed, their location, language, etc. All the varying things that an algorithm needs to create something like a curated list for you, the apps have very different methods on what they prioritize, and this is going to adversely affect what users see when they go and open the app. There is a reason why Instagram is most commonly associated with influencers, because the main feed that is on Instagram contains content that is shared by people that the users specifically follow. The Explore page is a secondary tab, and in order to actually see it, users have to click away from their main feed, something that they specifically have chosen to follow for people. On TikTok, though, that is reversed. The moment that you open up the app, you are automatically going to go to the For You page. That is the first thing that pops up as it immediately begins playing video. For You is specifically populated with videos that are selected by TikTok's algorithm, mostly from creators that the user does not actually follow. The app is constantly building this feed through a recommendation engine using artificial intelligence technologies and data mining practices. And while the app uses all of this information to construct your feed, how each user's feed is constructed had been a tightly held secret at least until June 2020. This being when TikTok would publish a blog post entitled How TikTok Recommends Videos Hashtag tag for you. The company says that its algorithm relies on a complex set of weighted factors to recommend content based on user preferences. These including hashtags, videos watched, videos liked, shared, commented on, as well as the kind of device that a person is using. Every single 
single person's feed is unique to that individual. And it is really important that I mention all this. It is vitally important to the entire context of this video, because I can tell you right now that as a creator, this has been both a boon and a curse for me. As I said from the very beginning of this video, I got my start on TikTok. And on one hand, this exact algorithm is the thing that would help me get started on content creation and skyrocketed me to where it is that I am today and be discovered. But on the other hand, it doesn't really matter who you follow or who you subscribe to or whatever on TikTok because the viewers are entirely at the whim of the algorithm. You don't have nearly as much of an impact on it as you think that you do. And so whether or not the algorithm could be influenced by an outside power and that outside power use your data, that is where questions start to appear. The app's insanely rapid growth has now put TikTok at the forefront of the minds of politicians as they wonder what does it mean to have a Chinese app so very quickly become part of modern life and completely take over the country effectively. I say politicians because it's not only the United States that has had this exact same kind of question. As an example, India has already banned TikTok and it has been banned for the last four years since 2020. Other governments have also banned or at least restricted TikTok with the reasons for this restriction or ban being different for each one, but for some it is national security, for others it is morality, it just entirely depends upon where it's coming from. But in the case of national security, both India and the United States have concerns that TikTok is collecting sensitive data from users that could potentially be used by the Chinese government for spying on you. According to its privacy policy, TikTok collects a range of user information, including location data and internet address, keystroke patterns, and the type of device being used to access the app. The app also goes and collects and stores a user's browsing and search history within the app, as well as the content of any messages that are exchanged using the app. Additional information can be collected based on user permissions, such as phone number, phone book, social network contacts, GPS data, user age, user generated content like your photos and videos, store payment information, and the videos liked, shared, watched, etc. The list goes on and on and on as to what the app actually does. Which definitely sounds like a lot, but the thing is, TikTok continues to state that the app, the information that it collects through it, is nothing more than what is already collected and done on other online platforms. These things are already done by Facebook, by Google. Both of these companies track user activity across devices, while TikTok claims that it doesn't do that. That being said, despite what it is that they insist, some critics of the app have described TikTok's approach to data mining as aggressive, and argues that its ability to track users' behavior while using the app as well as access to users' photos, videos, and phone book and geolocation tracking, based on user permissions, of course, means that it can build an extremely detailed behavioral profile of its users that could potentially be shared with the Chinese government. And that, my friends, is the big question and wording here. Could. Potentially. There's a lot of what-ifs in this scenario. As for why I go and say that, the entire issue that we're talking about here stems from the legal nightmare that is China's and the Chinese Communist Party's cybersecurity laws. And I'm going to need to explain this because this is something that genuinely is kind of scary and this is where a lot of concern actually comes from for politicians. The cybersecurity law of the People's Republic of China was passed in November of 2016 and it went into effect in June of 2017. It was updated in November of 2018 by the Regulations on Internet Security Supervision and Inspection by Public Security Organs and again in September of 2022. The law does several things. It strictly controls online activities, it mandates the local storage of user data data and the registration of certain network assets, and it allows the government to conduct on-site and remote inspection of computer networks. What this law does is that it requires Chinese companies to cooperate with government intelligence operations if so requested, and may allow the Chinese government to access user data that is collected by any company that is doing business in China. By demanding access to any data collected and stored in China, the updated regulations effectively force foreign companies that are based in China to comply with its investigative measures, leaving intellectual property and private information vulnerable to government abuse. The Chinese government could pretty much do whatever it is that it wanted. And the reality of the situation is, is that if you go and look at the history of ByteDance, there is something that at first glance really would scare a number of people. ByteDance already has a history of having to work with the CCP, just as any company already does in China, but it's not necessarily one by choice. Not that it matters, of 
course, because again, this is quite literally China. That, that's what happens. It's China. And here's an example of what it is that I mean. In April of 2018, China's state media regulator, the National Radio and Television Administration, or the NRTA, would order a temporary removal of To Tiao and Nehan Duanzi from Chinese app stores. The NRTA would accuse Nehan Duanzi in particular of hosting, quote, vulgar and improper content and, quote, triggering strong sentiments of resentment among internet users. Because, you know, people would go and complain on the internet about crap that their government does. And that's something you can't do in China. You remember how I talked about Nehan Duanzi being permanently shut down in 2018? Yeah, that's what this is. The following day, Nehan Duanzi would announce that it was permanently shutting down. In response to the shutdown, Zhang Yiming would issue a letter stating that the app was incommensurate with socialist core values and that he promised that Byte dance would quote further deepen cooperation with the authorities to promote their policies following the shutdown ByteDance would then announce that it was going to give preference to chinese communist party members in its hiring and it would increase the number of censor employees as in the people who were supposed to be censoring content from 6,000 to 10,000, which is a little bit concerning but again this is china as of the year 2019 ByteDance's beijing headquarters has maintained an office where cybersecurity police are stationed so that illegal content can be instantly reported. In November of 2019, the Cyberspace Administration of China, or CAC, would order ByteDance to remove, quote, slanderous information on Feng Jimin. Feng was a historical Chinese communist leader, and this slanderous information on him was on To Tiao, which China did not like. Furthermore, in April of 2020, the CAC would then order ByteDance to take down its office collaboration tool, Lark, because this is something that could actually be used to circumvent internet censorship, something that, again, the CCP does not like. And that, my friends, is where things really start to escalate. 2020. First off, as I talked about, it started with the explosive growth on the part of TikTok. It was during this time in the COVID-19 pandemic that it seemed like everyone, their mom, their creepy uncle, everyone that you could imagine, had jumped onto the TikTok bandwagon. In quarter one of 2020 alone, the app had some 315 million downloads, which is the best quarter that has been ever experienced by any app ever in history. YouTube, Facebook, Snapchat, none of that matters. This, this is the biggest one ever. One of the reasons for this is that as the virus started to spread all around the world, governments were urging residents to practice social distancing and isolation, to stay inside and not actually go out, to not go anywhere. And with people suddenly being forced to compress their lives into the four corners of their home and that is it, naturally speaking, you noticed a significant spike in anxiety, depression, and just in general, being closed off from the outside world. And that, my friends, is where TikTok would come in. As more and more people were staying home, and in particular teenagers who had nothing to do, more people wanted to be able to participate, to create, to share, to actually do things and interact with people, to have themselves be heard in the world. And TikTok content began to then go mega viral at this time. And the government, in turn, well, they took notice. In January of 2019, an investigation was done by the American think tank, the Peterson Institute for International Economics, which would describe TikTok as posing a national security threat to the West because of the app's popularity with Western users and because of its association, potentially, with the CCP. They included risk to armed force personnel due to the app's alleged ability to convey location, image, and biometric data to its Chinese parent company, which is legally, as we said before, unable to refuse to share data with the Chinese government under the China Internet Security Law. Remember, as I just said, ByteDance's founder and CEO, Zhang Yiming, had issued a letter in in 2018, stating that his company would, quote, further deepen cooperation with the ruling Chinese Communist Party to promote its policies. Now, when we talk about all that, ByteDance continuously contends that TikTok is not available in China. That is, Douyin, that TikTok is something that is completely separate and that its data is stored outside of China. In response to national security, censorship, and anti-boycott compliance concerns, in October of 2019, Senator Marco Rubio would ask the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the C FIUS to open an investigation into TikTok and ByteDance. That same month, Senators Tom Cotton and Chuck Schumer would send a joint letter to the Director of National Intelligence requesting a security review of TikTok and ByteDance. This would, in turn, be followed in July 2020 by the United States Department of the Treasury announcing that TikTok was officially under CFIUS review. And it's at this point, my friends, that things really do start to change. As all of this is going on, Senator Josh Hawley would go and introduce a National Security and Personal Data Protection Act to prohibit TikTok's parent company and other 
others from transferring the personal data of Americans to China. Senator Hawley would also introduce a bill that would ban downloading and using TikTok on government devices because of national security concerns. In December of 2019, the United States Navy, as well as the U.S. Army, would ban TikTok from all government-issued devices. Next to the TSA, the Transportation Security Administration would also prohibit its personnel from posting on the platform for outreach purposes. And thus, following its prohibition by the U.S. military, the Australian Defense Force would also ban TikTok on its devices. Legislation was then subsequently introduced in the United States Senate that would prohibit all federal employees from using or downloading TikTok. So, my friends, all of this is happening in rapid order. Really, the next step at this point was trying to apply it everywhere. And can you guess the firecracker that was going to start all of that? Well, naturally, that would be one of the spicier topics to talk about on the internet, President Donald Trump. Starting in July of 2020, then-President Donald Trump had launched a public attack on TikTok, threatening specifically to ban it from the United States on the grounds that the Chinese Communist Party could use data that was gathered on its users to spy on U.S. citizens. He demanded at the time that TikTok be sold to U.S. interests in order to specifically eliminate the threat of possibly being controlled by China. Now, it is no secret that there are many issues that we could potentially talk about that are quite divisive, that unfortunately the reality of the day that we live in, especially for those in the United States, States is that every single thing seems to be partisan. But concerns about social media companies' use and misuse of private information? That is something that is one of the rare things that has been a bipartisan issue in Washington. So, the concern that Trump had actually did gain some traction. However, by September of 2020, Trump had effectively declared that he had solved the problem, that things were over. TikTok's U.S. operations would be severed from its Chinese owner, ByteDance, and instead, this would be incorporated as a U.S. company. This may have intended to alleviate concerns that China was using TikTok to gather data on Americans, but apparently when we are talking about this, the actual change that would occur was very minimal. TikTok data on U.S. servers was always being held in the United States, so it was just really moving it from one cloud to another. This has been a common talking point specifically used by TikTok representatives to try and defend the company before Congress. Still, the deal that we're talking about here is something that was stalled numerous times by court challenges, and the future of that proposed deal remains very uncertain under the Biden administration. During a White House briefing that would occur on February 10th, 2021, then-Press Secretary Jen Zaski would deny that President Biden had set any new policy on the app, saying, and I quote, So it's not accurate to suggest that there is a new proactive step by the Biden White House. I will note, broadly speaking, we are comprehensively evaluating the risks to U.S. data, including from TikTok, and will address them in a decisive and effective fashion, end quote. Still, though, when talking about being decisive, Zasky declined to actually set a timetable for when such a review would occur, and at this point, it's been several years. We all kind of know that, considering that I'm talking about this video right now. So yes, Donald Trump would then leave office on January 20th, 2021, and the following June, the new president, Joe Biden, would sign an executive order that revoked the Trump's administration's ban on TikTok and instead ordered the Secretary of Commerce to investigate the app to determine if it actually does pose a threat to U.S. national security. So, okay, we have some changes here, right? But then, do you remember how in 2021 there was a massive breach in Facebook and uh, this kind of stirred up the hornet's nest when talking about data ethics and what it is that you can do online? Yeah, that was going to kick things into high gear then. 2021 actually had quite a number of data breaches, something that scared quite a number of people in Congress. And so in October of 2021, following the Facebook files and controversies about social media ethics, a bipartisan group of lawmakers would press TikTok, YouTube, and Snapchat on questions of data privacy and moderation for age-appropriate content. Lawmakers would go and question Michael Beckerman, who was the head of U.S. policy at TikTok, on whether or not the company's Chinese ownership could expose consumer data to Beijing, and stating concerns that the company could be required by the Chinese government to turn American data over to the government. What TikTok would do is that it would tell U.S. lawmakers that it does not give information to the Chinese government and that the data on American users is stored specifically in the U.S. with backups in Singapore. According to the company's representative, TikTok had no affiliation with ByteDance technology in which the Chinese government does have a minority stake and a board seat. But, because there always has to be a but in this scenario. In June of 2022, reports emerged that ByteDance employees in China could actually access U.S. data and repeatedly had access to 
private information of TikTok users. TikTok employees were cited saying that, quote, everything is seen in China, while one director claimed a Beijing-based engineer referred to as a master admin has access to everything. Following the reports, TikTok would go and announce that 100% of its US user traffic would now be routed to Oracle Cloud, along with their intention to delete all US user data from their own data centers. This arrangement would stem specifically from the talks that they had had with Oracle that began back in September of 2020 in the midst of the Trump threat to ban the app, though Oracle did not ultimately end up acquiring any actual part of TikTok. The whole ordeal that we're talking about is something called Project Texas, and that is still something that is kind of in question. And what I mean by that is that in June of 2022, after the pressure from the US government, TikTok did begin routing all of its US data to Oracle's cloud infrastructure. And from there, Oracle would begin vetting TikTok's algorithm and content moderation models to ensure that they were not being manipulated by Chinese authorities. This entire move, everything that they did in here, it wasn't a small thing, mind you. When we talk about the cost of Project Texas, of what TikTok spent in order to be able to continue to operate in the US and actually function, was a $1.5 billion plan specifically made sure and ensuring Americans that TikTok was safe, that their data was secure, and that the platform is free from outside influence. With the name itself, Project Texas, being referred to as that because Oracle here is actually based in Texas. But that all being said, after the leak, as you can imagine, things heated up pretty fast after that. In December of 2022, Senator Marco Rubio and Representatives Mike Gallagher and Raja Krishnamurthy would introduce the Averting the National Threat of Internet Surveillance, Oppressive Censorship and Influence, and Algorithmic Learning by the Chinese Communist Party Act. Which, oh my god, that name. You can actually see it right here up on the screen behind me for what that is. It, it literally is just something that spells out as an acronym, the Anti-Social CCP Act, which is still a massive massive name to have here in the first place. But that is something that would prohibit Chinese and Russian-owned social networks from actually doing business in the United States. Very shortly after this, on December 30th, 2022, President Joe Biden would sign the No TikTok on Government Devices Act, which, as you can probably guess from the name there, would prohibit the use of the app on devices that were owned by the federal government, with only a few exceptions. Days after, the Biden administration would then call on ByteDance, which owns TikTok, to sell the platform or face a ban. Law enforcement Enforcement officials at this time would disclose that an investigation into TikTok was taking place. On January 25th, 2023, the Missouri Senator Josh Hawley, who we talked about before, would introduce a bill to ban the platform nationwide, but this was later blocked in the Senate by a forced vote on the 29th of March, 2023. At the same time that this is happening, in February and March of 2023, the Data Act and the Restrict Act were both introduced in the House of Representatives and the Senate, respectively. The Data Act, introduced on February 24th by Michael McCall, would aim to ban selling non-public personal data to third-party buyers, and on March 7th, Senator Mark Warner would introduce the Restrict Act, which would give the Secretary of Commerce the authority to review business transactions made by IT services and product vendors that were tied to designated, quote, foreign adversaries, if they present an undue threat to national security and have more than 1 million active users in the United States. And so gee whiz, I, I, I do wonder what that could possibly be meant to target. I don't know. I just, I, I really, I really don't know. Seems like an odd question, really. The legislation would specifically allow for enforcement of orders and other mitigation measures, which would include mandatory divestment, so being forced to actually sell off or release control of one's company, or being prohibited from doing business in the United States. And all of this, all of the things that I've been talking about here would ultimately culminate in one of the dumbest things that would occur here in 2023, the TikTok congressional hearing of March of 2023. Now, my friends, there is a very distinct reason as to why I am saying that this thing was infamous. Creators and commenters would share their critiques live as the hearing would air as the whole thing was streamed directly onto TikTok and to many other social media platforms. The general consensus from the internet is that lawmakers didn't really seem to know much about what kind of platform they were even trying to litigate in the first place. And on top of that, they never really gave the TikTok CEO, Xiao Xi Chu, a fair chance to actually speak about the thing that he was being called there to speak about. And if you were wanting some specific examples to show just how ridiculous this entire thing got, well, buckle up, because during the five hour hearing, there were many different clips that were made, and quite a number of these went mega viral across the internet. And it didn't really make Congress look good. Like, as we go and talk about this, I'm going to pull up a number of them as I'm talking about them here. 
In one of the most widely shared videos with over a million views, one of these would show Georgia Representative Earl Buddy Carter asking Chu whether or not the phone camera tracks users' pupil dilations, which Chu would very quickly refute, saying that TikTok does not use body, face, or voice data to identify users. Whether the content that elicits a pupil dilation should be amplified by the algorithm? Can you tell me that? As the video started to go viral across the internet, comments such as, I get secondhand embarrassment watching these corpses try to make points, would fill the comment section as, generally speaking, the entire collective Congress were referred to as boomers. A word on the internet that, although the original meaning was a reference to specifically baby boomers, it has now come to mean elderly individuals that do not seem to understand anything about youth. Or in this sense, really any kind of technology. Because Carter would later ask how the app determines the age of a user, insinuating that it has to be from some kind of biometric data, where Chu then had to explain that the users provide their age when they sign up for an account. In another very viral clip, North Carolina representative Richard Hudson would ask Chu if TikTok can, quote, access the home Wi-Fi network, which the majority of people found very confusing to hear as it is an app on a smartphone and most apps require internet access to actually be able to function in the first place. Cause you know, that's how you watch things. Mr. Chu, does TikTok access the home Wi-Fi network? If the user turns on the Wi-Fi, I, I'm sorry, I may not understand the... All across the internet, U.S. lawmakers were getting absolutely ridiculed, with the majority of viral reaction videos calling out how politicians that were pressing Chu for answers seemed to be interrupting him instead of actually just letting him answer their questions in the first place. At one such point in a line of questioning about dangerous trends, like how in 2021 there was something called the Blackout Challenge, Carter did not allow Chu to speak for more than a few seconds before he immediately cut it in and started ranting. And so ironically enough, despite the fact that this was a serious matter and much of the backlash was quite angry about it, a lot of users on the internet and on TikTok as a whole did what TikTok does best, turning things into funny short jokes. They resorted to making jokes and memes to highlight just how out of touch they believed their congressmen were during the hearing. As all of this was going down, live streams of the events were constantly being drowned in a stream of criticism, with many users denouncing how Congress was taking a very real issue, something where there was tenable concern over app security threats and saying that lawmakers just did not seem to know anything about what they were talking about, that they were uninformed of how the app works, how the internet works, how literally any form of technology works at all, thereby making Americans look dumb in front of the entire world. Others were doing more than just criticizing. They were doing deep dives on which members of Congress specifically own stock in TikTok's competitors, including this guy that you can see right here, U.S. Senator Mark Warner, a Democrat out of Virginia who is one of the wealthiest senators with a net worth of approximately $300 million. When remember, a U.S. Senator only gets paid $174,000 a year. And this guy just so happened to be one of the people who had introduced the Senate's version of the bill to ban TikTok. What was frustrating to many people that were watching this was the sheer irony of a Congress that just couldn't seem to be bothered to address any kind of real issues that the nation was facing. That nothing was being done about student loan debt, nothing was being done about healthcare, nothing was being done about any of the issues that were affecting the average day person, but instead they could all seemingly come together to try and care about the youth by banning something that they loved. Now of course it is nothing new for the next generation to be disillusioned with the government. That is something that almost always happens every single time there is a new generation. But what is so different in this rapidly changing world is that the technologically illiterate people who are in Congress, generally speaking, are the ones who are making rules for the most tech-savvy generation. And this is a problem that people are just now being forced to try and navigate. And it's not just Congress that is doing this. Some college campuses have also instituted bans on TikTok, which students are simply able to then bypass by not using the campus Wi-Fi. They instead just use their own data on their phones, and there's nothing really the campus can do about it. And some of the stuff is absolutely insane. The governor of Utah went and signed into law two bills addressing children and their social media use this year, one of which imposes a social media curfew from 10.30 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. While it is true that these bills do try and attempt to address the very real need for kids to be protected on the internet, something that is the Wild West and very uncertain, these things are being created by people who have literally never met a teenager, it seems, or have any understanding of how technology works. Even 
even when it comes to provisions that are rather well-meaning, trying to force apps to cease advertisements to children, don't even do this in a way that is very effective. Because instead of policing the data miners themselves, the state wants social media companies to somehow perfectly verify the age of its users. And how this is actually going to happen in practice, well, no one can really guess, but they don't seem to understand that this is not something that is able to easily be implemented. And there is possibly no finer example of that than the map that you can see behind me right here. As of 2023, at least 34 of 50 states have announced or enacted bans on state government agencies, employees, or contractors using TikTok on government-issued devices. And while in the beginning, mostly these were Republican-led efforts, the issue very quickly became bipartisan, and Democrat-led states would also follow. State bans only affect government employees, and normally do not prohibit civilians from having or using the app on their personal devices. Uh, until Montana came around. Yeah, you see, on April 14th, 2023, Montana would become the very first state to pass legislation that would ban TikTok on all personal devices operating within state lines and barring app stores from offering TikTok for download. Which, if you're questioning as to how exactly that would work, um, yeah, that was, that was generally the problem that the majority of people had in the first place. Yeah, when this whole thing would go down, the governor of Montana would sign Senate Bill 419 into law on May 17th, claiming that he had specifically banned TikTok to protect Montanans' personal and private data from the Chinese Communist Party, because that's definitely what the CCP wants. The data of people in Montana, of all things. The law was scheduled to take effect in January of 2024. However, content creators within Montana would file a lawsuit against the state once the bill was signed, and now everything is just kind of up in question about it. It's actually interesting because TikTok itself is financing the lawsuit against the state. And they're not the only ones that are opposing things. Groups such as the ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation would also oppose the ban, stating that it constituted censorship and that it would set a very alarming precedent for excessive government control over how Montanans would use the internet. Many groups would argue that the ban is unconstitutional, that it is something that violates the freedom of speech clause of the First Amendment. The lawsuit that we spoke about would in turn be filed hours after the bill was signed into law, and a spokeswoman on behalf of Montana Attorney General Austin Knudsen would say that the state was, quote, fully prepared to defend the law. Still, though, it wasn't necessarily going to work out very well, at least not yet, because in a preliminary ruling on November 30th of 2023, federal judge Donald Malloy would block the law, citing constitutional concerns. Specifically, Judge Malloy would would write that, quote, the state fails to show how Senate Bill 419 is constitutionally permissible. Like, th th there's nothing that actually shows how this is something that's even possible to do. Like, it doesn't make sense, and it's not constitutional. Which, on that note, not making sense is a very real reality that any kind of these laws that states try to pass do face, because the law has some very severe technical restrictions. The App Store and Google Play Store, these things for Apple and Google respectively, they don't track users by state. They track users by the country that they're in, which means that they would need to define the behavior when a user crosses state lines. While technically speaking, Apple and Google could perhaps use IP addresses to track device locations, users would very easily be able to use a virtual private network, a VPN, to just completely get around that restriction. If these app stores are found to be hosting TikTok for Montana users, violators could face fines of $10,000 per day. But these companies, as they are, can't simply remove the availability of an app for just a singular state. And all all of this creates one of the most deliciously ironic and stupid things that I have seen in here yet, as TikTok has stated that in order for it to follow the laws that some of these states want, like in the case of Montana, that it will actually need to collect data from the users to know where they are in order to comply with the bill that is supposed to stop TikTok from knowing where they are. Do you not... Do, 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 do you not see what I'm talking Like, I'm getting all flabbergasted here at this point when I'm talking about this, but it's like, it's the literal definition of people not understanding exactly how technology works. And that, my friends, brings us to where we are today, or at least at the time that I am writing and recording this video this week, which is in March of 2024. Right now, it is March 15th, and I'm even sitting down recording this after I started recording it last night on March 14th, and all of this went down here in just this week. Congress is actually moving forward with the TikTok bill as it has passed through the House. As you all have seen over the course of this video, TikTok has long denied that it could be used as a tool by the Chinese government. The company has said that it 
never shares US user data with Chinese authorities and that it will not do so even if it is asked. To date, the US government also has not actually provided any evidence that shows that TikTok shares such information with Chinese authorities. When this bill was introduced in the first place, a House committee would approve the legislation unanimously on a 50 to zero vote. This being even after offices were inundated with calls from TikTok users that were demanding that they drop the effort. As for what is going to happen next, we don't necessarily really know, but things are moving rather quickly. A House committee would approve the legislation unanimously on a 50 to zero vote. This being even after their offices were inundated with calls from a TikTok users demanding that they stop their efforts. Some offices even went as far as having to shut their phones down because of the sheer onslaught of calls. Which at first, for anyone who is listening to this right now, it's going to sound like, okay, well, it's going to show the congressman that people are angry, that they don't want this to be banned. But supporters of the bill are saying that the efforts actually backfire. According to the representative Mike Gallagher, it, quote, provided members with a preview of just how the platform could be weaponized in order to inject disinformation into our system. Truly, it is one of the most ironic things that I could possibly think of, that the sheer amount of people that were calling in order to express their displeasure that something could be banned and in turn strengthen the opinion of people wanting it banned because people were angry at them. I don't even know if at the time that I'm recording this that I can even process the irony of that statement. The reality of the situation is that lawmakers in both parties are anxious to confront China on a variety of different issues. The House has formed a special committee to focus specifically on China-related issues alone. Mark Warner, that individual that we talked about before, is the Senate Intelligence Committee chairman, and he would announce after the House vote that he was going to work to, quote, get this bill passed through the Senate and signed into law. In a joint statement with Marco Rubio of Florida, the top Republican on the intelligence panel, Warner would say that, quote, we are united in our concern about the national security threat posed by TikTok, a platform with enormous power to influence and divide Americans whose parent company ByteDance remains legally required to do the bidding of the Chinese Communist Party. And all of this is happening after TikTok has already separated itself pretty much from ByteDance, that all the data, everything that we have talked about, the $1.5 billion that was spent on Project Texas to specifically remove data from being able to be accessed by anyone that was in China, that all of that seems to have been for nothing, at least per US Congress. But that all being said, to finish off this video in what is perhaps the greatest example of hypocrisy that we have seen on here from everything that we have talked about, President Joe Biden would host a young group of over 70 social media influencers at the White House this past week here as part of his State of the Union address. And now mind you, when I say this, there is nothing inherent wrong about that, except that of the many people that were invited, quite a number were TikTokers, creators of the very thing that the government was actively trying to ban. Despite the president's very advanced age, White House staff continue to try to find ways to make an impact on social media, specifically to do as much as they can to try appeal to younger populations, as it is on social media where the majority of these individuals that are going to be the next voters get their news and information. On top of all that, Biden himself, or at least his campaign, actually does already have a TikTok account. This being despite widespread government concerns about the platform being used by the Chinese government to spy on Americans, he himself, technically speaking, uses it. The problem is the lack of understanding for how this technology or just about any technology works, the blatant hypocrisy of politicians, and the sheer size of the demographic that is being affected here means that no matter what road or path this political journey takes us, it's going to be a rocky one, ban or otherwise. It doesn't matter, but the future is probably going to get really messy. And that, my friends, is the end of where things stand, at least today. But everyone, this has been Sakuyi with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. Thank you very much for watching. If you could like, comment, and subscribe, I would greatly appreciate it. Considering the sheer amount of time, effort, and energy that goes into making, researching, and editing a video like this, it really is helpful for me to know that you all like to see what I am making in the first place. I appreciate all of you, and I hope that you put in the comments below what it is that you'd like to see next. I know that the video I have after this is going to be an analysis in what has been going on with Boeing and the history of disasters that they are experiencing. But then after that, we're going to need to do another geopolitics video. Thank you, my friends, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.